Hello and welcome to the Liverpool Way podcast. We're just a couple of days away from the start of a new Premier League season, the first with new manager Arna Slot in charge at Anfield. Pre-season performances have been promising, with signs the new boss is getting his ideas across quickly. But off the field there are familiar concerns about a lack of ambition in the market, major stress about the contractual status of star players and worried the squad's promising young talents are being used as chips to balance the books. We'll be reacting to all of this with an eye on the new campaign ahead and what we can expect in this new era. I'm Chris Smith and I have TLW editor Dave Usher here along with TLW veteran the venerable Paul Natten. Dave, uh, how's it going? It's been a while since we did this. Yeah. Uh, we promised more season pods, but I guess we can <laughs> lay the blame at the door of the nerds now running the club for not giving us any new signings to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we did say we'll be back anytime we make a signing. So, yeah, we, we, we didn't come back. And we're only back now because the season's starting because there's still no signings. We did do a... A ghost pod the other day, me and Paul with the Zubamendi. Paul was tipping us to win the league. <laughs> uh, well, once again, <laughs> that, one, that one's never gonna. <laughs> it's never gonna be heard. <laughs> no, I'm joking. We learnt our lesson from last time. We we were waiting that for that one to get actually signed and sealed, and it never was. So, I'm sure we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, and I hear you've got a, a new pet project down at the safari park or the zoo or wherever it is. You go and look at parrots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I've had to. I've had to give up on the uh, the green parrots. They they were just not learning. So I did read that African greys are the smart ones. So I've uh, yeah, I've been trying to get the African greys doing the Nunes chant. It's uh, it's not the safari park. It's just uh, the the uh, botanical gardens in Southport. So it was there what, two days ago. Yeah, I'm s- still sticking at it. I'll get there in the end. But yeah, I've got to go with the African greys now because then the green ones were just thick as pig shit. Paul, how about you, man? How's your summer been so far? Yeah, great. Thanks, mate. Got enjoying time off work. Just had a just back on Monday nights from um, a couple of weeks in Corfu with the wider family. It was nice. We've got our Harry's come home from university. Our Ella's about to go, so it's kind of like a I don't know. Felt like a last opportunity maybe for the whole big family to go away together, and we had a great time. Weather was sensational. Um, yeah, it wasn't too much Liverpool related stuff to to distract me away from the pool and uh, and the bevies. So yeah, I had a had a great time. Nice. But um, yeah, it was really good. Nice, nice family time, and uh, just starting to get my head into all this footy stuff now, like the rest of us, I suppose. Feels a bit weird, I think. Doesn't Back it? to There's reality bit... now. Yeah, yeah, and and just no Kloppo. It's not. I don't know. Just a little bit strange watching videos without him, and yeah. you know, I just. And I think it's inevitable, really, after so long with him and with him being such a giant character. And this, you know, this is not going to be the Jurgen Klopp pod. I know that, but it just feels just a little bit, a little bit weird at this stage of the season without him, without his familiar smiling face. I there. wasn't feeling like that, you know. I, I felt like totally at peace with it all. Uh, you know, when he left, I, I was just I was happy for him. You know, he, he needs a break, and he, he's he's done everything that like that he could. It's like okay, this is his time. I had no no regrets or anything like that, and I was kind of excited about like. You know, new era and that, and yeah, I was out for something to eat last night, and like the the place we were in, like the you know, like the background music, and I just heard something, and I'm like, wait, what's that? And it was new to me and everything, and then I was just sat there, just my that. shoulders just slumped, and I was just sitting there going, yeah, yeah. oh fuck, <laughs> and yeah. I, I think that was when like it, that's where it finally just like hit home with me. That like we're going into a new season, and he's not going to be stood there on on the touchline like shouting and. That's nothing to do with like Arna Slot. I'm in terms of like who we could get in and who's you know, I'm not unhappy in the slightest at, at the choice that we've made. And I'm feeling like hopeful that he's gonna do well. It's, it's none of yeah. this is about him, but it is just you know, especially because like where I sit instinctively, I'm always just like looking down to see what's Kloppo doing. And I'm gonna be looking down and be like, oh shit, he's not there now. And that'll probably be just dazzled by yeah. like Slot's bald exactly. head. So that's a concern. <laughs> For, for me, it's a case of like I don't quite feel um, 
in it. it I, I almost feel strange as if I'm looking at it and looking at everything that's happening and watching the preseason games almost as like a third party. I don't quite yet have the sense that it's us and there's a we element to it. You know, yeah. it, it just kind of yeah. feels a little bit odd from that respect. And I'm sure that'll change as the season goes on. At least I hope it does. But um, yeah, right now it just feels it feels very much just like a little bit sort of not isolated but disconnected from the club and uh, and yeah so although we are well i am in uh, feeling a little bit disconnected from everything at the moment it's a time to to get connected um the game is coming up against ipswich on uh, saturday and if we do anything like we've done in in pre-season dave we, we should be all right because the signs on the field have certainly been uh, promising, convincing wins against Arsenal and Manchester United, a good performance uh, at Anfield on Sunday against um, Sevilla, um, some decent football being played, uh, some wins on the board. You can't read too much into pre-season, but you'd certainly rather it be this way than than yeah. you know struggling to find rhythm and looking poor on the field. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I sort of know what you mean about, like, not so much disconnected, but I know, I know like where you're coming from. I feel like... Um, Last weekend got me a bit more into it, you know, like ready for the season. Just like because it's a game around field and it was a good performance, and it, you, you can't. Some of the players are back now who weren't there in pre season. So I think overall, again, pre season doesn't, I wouldn't say it doesn't mean anything. It does. The results don't particularly mean anything, but you need to be able to see signs of like, especially when you've got a new manager, you need to see, okay. Are the players like are they up to speed with what he wants to do? And you know, can you see? Does it look like it's working? And I don't think we could have any complaints on that front. You know, I think that maybe mm-hmm. a bit ahead of schedule, even, which is probably partly due to the fact it's not massively different. There's obviously differences, and like you know, Curtis has spoke about it. Harvey spoke. I think um, Connor Bradley as well. A few of them have said about the, the the common theme seems to be we want to play a little bit more through the midfield, keep possession a bit more. Which is we were saying last season. Maybe we need to be a little bit less like not gung ho. That's not the right word, but you know, just a, like a bit, a little bit less mad and have a little bit more control. And we were saying that, and like that's what slots come in and that seems to be like what what he's looked at he wants to keep the good stuff that we do but maybe just add a little bit more control to stop us being as vulnerable on like counter attacks and stuff and the way with with the the extra deep midfielder rather than like that we play with like the one six is kind of playing with two uh it remains to be seen what he'll do with like with whether trent will invert or not um did seem to do that a bit against Sevilla. You know, the it, the fullbacks do play narrower uh, in the build-up. Like that's been noticeable. So there's like little things that you can see are different, but it's not like this massive overhaul and like a a huge change to what we do. So that's probably helped with the players to pick it up more quickly. Like what what he's looking for. But I don't think he's being helped in the sense that like a lot of us star players weren't there until right mm-hmm. at the end. And I think the team that started against Sevilla will probably be more or less what we see at Ipswich. Um, there's a couple might come in. You know, you, you could maybe make a case of Robbo coming back in. I'm not sure that'll happen. I think Costas has played every game and he's played well in pre-season. I think Robbo's only just back. Probably makes sense to just stick with Costas for this weekend. I don't think there'll be too yeah. many other changes. I think Quans has played himself into the team. It Quans had ended last season as first choice ahead of Canate. And I did see some comments on Canate over the summer where he was kind of dismissing that and saying, yeah, um, you know, I don't feel like I lost my place. It was just, there was a bit of rotation going on. I'm like, no, we were playing one game a mm-hmm. week in the last four weeks of the season. It wasn't like midweek games and we were swapping things around. Kwanzaa was just getting picked ahead of you for the last four games. And I'm pretty sure he'll still be getting picked ahead of him um, going into the season because he's, he's earned the right. He's played that well. So... I don't think we're going to see too many changes there. I do feel Harvey will be really unlucky if he's not in the the starting eleven. But it does kind of I mean, look same like old story on that. Front. Yeah, it does look like he maybe won't be, and he's going to be probably coming on after an hour, like his role that for most of last season. Um, Jota has been here a, a lot longer than Gakpo and Nunes, so Jota is in good form pre-season, and I think with Jota, it's like well, just make the most of him while he's fit playing while he's fifth because eventually he's going to get injured so there's no point having him on the bench you know when he's when he's available 
because there's plenty of time for him to not be available down the line. So going yeah. into the season, I think it makes sense for him to be starting. Um, Diaz wasn't here pre-season, but he was just the obvious choice to come in and play on the left, you know, because Carvalho played there while Diaz was still on his holidays and that. So Carvalho's gone. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, Connor Bradley's unlucky to, to not be playing because Trent's only just come back in, but I do think Trent looked good enough against Severe. He looked in, in he looked sharp. He looked I thought he looked really good. So he's gonna play. And the lads who were involved in that second game against Las Palmas, I think most of them are not gonna be in the team. And I mean I'm not reading anything into that performance because I think it's really difficult. If you're in that team and everyone else has just played in front of sixty thousand at Anfield and then you're out there in an empty stadium and no one like will wear the B team today. So you're not it's it's a training session. They're not gonna be as at it as the as the lads who played earlier in the day are. Mm-hmm. So although that was nil nil, I'm not really reading anything into that. And some of the players just needed to just get like some time under the belts because they're only just back in, in Darwin's case and Robbo's only just come back to training. Um so yeah, I think pre-season's gone really well. There's lots of encouraging signs. It looks like the players have picked up what what slots wanting them to do. We won't know for certain until it kicks off, at, at, you know, against Ipswich, um, because pre-season. I mean, Sevilla looked like they were just out for a bit of a stroll. I don't think they took that game particularly seriously. Um, mm-hmm. United and Arsenal, they were they were decent games actually, but then. Uh, after yeah, an hour, every everyone's bringing kids on, and so you can't, you're not getting a, a full uh, reflection of it. But the first half against Arsenal, they had close to their first team out. There wasn't too many missing. Yeah. We still had like loads of players missing at that point, and we played really well. You know, it was, it was a good performance. Um, one thing I have noticed, and and it's, you know, for a fact, there's going to be a few occasions this season when. Allison's going to give a goal away from like passing it around with his feet, and it's not a criticism of Allison. It's, it's just the fact that we're taking more risks the way we play, and also there's going to be goals given away. Uh, like Curtis has got away with murder in some of these games. Like you know when the ball's played into mm-hmm. midfield and he's got a man on it, he's and he's lost the ball so many times, and it's not led to anything, and it's because of like. We're just doing this more now, you know. That's the that's how Slot wants to play. There's more of that, like building through like the the, the two midfield players, and I don't like it. I, I I just think they've think they've got to get used to it. But there's going to be some teething problems, no doubt about it. I mean, look, Paul. I think like if you um if you're talking about having more control uh, and playing in a way that that's not as as chaotic and leaving us vulnerable, then. Are you robbing Peter to pay Paul by just having us pass around in the six-yard box, which is calamitous in a lot of the instances mm. that we see it and doesn't seem to work as often as it fails? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm open-minded about all of that, really. I mean, I think I've yeah. not been somebody who's been jittery about us doing it previously. I mean, I mean, it remains to be seen, doesn't it? If it becomes a problem, then we'll need to cross that bridge when we come to it. However, if, if it is a problem... I think it'll be one where the answer will be let's do it better rather than let's not do it at all because that's the way all modern coaches are, aren't yeah. they? Mm-hmm. It's about it's about perfecting um, your principles rather than compromising your principles, um, and that is clearly one of his principles. Um, so I mean, I don't really get too hung up about that, and particularly from pre-season. I mean, I, I, Dave wrote something in the I think it was in the diary, which actually um, I thought it was a really good point actually about how we view pre-season. I've always been quite dismissive of pre-season, you know, for, for most of our, well, all of us really, our years supporting Liverpool, pre-season's been like a glorified fitness thing. But, yeah, but it's, it's. I think, Dave, you made the point that it's not that no, anymore because these are, these are the sorts of, this is the generation of players who take a, a, a private physio away and yeah. hold with them. So their levels never really drop. It's it's more about tactical setup, coaching, pure coaching, team bonding, all of that kind of stuff. And I think from that perspective, I've not watched any of the games deliberately. I, st- I just can't get excited about non-competitive football, really. Um, I am interested in the takeaways from it. I'm interested in the in the opinions of people who've watched it and, and you know, summarise it. I want to know what Slot thinks. I want to see the goals, all that sort of stuff. So I, I can't pretend I'm not interested in that. I am. You're not staying up at half, so, until half 12. But no, it, no, no. And even if it was on at a reasonable time, I almost certainly wouldn't put it well, on. A reasonable time for you um, is what? Six? <laughs> Any later than that? A bit, bit late that night, to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Uh, but you know the things that the things that seem encouraging to me are, you know, seeing that seeing the training videos. He's very hands on with his training, and it's very clear from the little snippets of patterns of play that they've picked things up quickly. I know he's talked about wanting to sharpen things, and that's of course we're talking about elite football. So there's no way in a matter of weeks he can have a team of players, no matter a squad of players, no matter how talented they are, drilled in the way he wants them drilled. But obviously they've picked up his message as well. That's a good sign. The goals seem to be flowing. Another good sign. And we don't seem to be conceding many. Another good sign. And then the control thing, you know, I'm suspending my disbelief. It'll take a lot to move me away from my love of the, the, the Klopp era thrills. Um, but I do recognise that, you know, strategically it might be a much better tactic for us if we want to win a league in which Manchester City exists. Um, that you know we might have to we might have to have that more more of an element of control and certainly in twenty in um, in twenty twenty when we won the title um, last we introduced more control that season yeah um, and that and that paid off well for us then so yeah I mean I think I think uh, yeah it's been in terms of how it plays out I really I'm open minded I just want to see how it goes I, I've never been someone to get jittery about it being knocked around the back I kind of accept that's what we do and it's what pretty much everyone does. Um, as long as we are getting my results, dad says hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as long as as long as we uh, as long as we get the results and we see some entertaining football and goals, then I'll you know I'll be fine. Um, so we will just have to see how it goes. I guess the, the passing out at the back thing, um, <clears throat> we've always done it. We did it under Klopp. Yeah. It's just yeah. it's going to be taken to another level now. More and I tried to Do warn you know, my dad because I watched the preseason games and and I said to him, "Look, you got to prepare yourself." Because my dad hated it all that. He's always one of them. Just get rid of it. He just yeah. he doesn't like yeah. it. And because he doesn't trust Allison with his feet, and Keller has his boy, um, he doesn't like Allison play. And I I totally get it because I sort of agree. I think he takes risks. He thinks he's better than he is with his feet, and he will get caught out. But. I tried to warn him, and I was like, you know, you don't like how we we've played around at the back previously. I'm just letting you know we're going to be doing that a hell of a lot more. And he, he watched like the first half of the uh, severe game, and like he rings me at half time, and he's like, he played well there, didn't he? It was good, enjoyed that. And he went to tell you what, though, I don't like all of that, like passing around <laughs> at the back. And I'm like, yeah. that was my first reaction when you. I saw that that great goal. <laughs> I know. I mean that was a great goal. It was it was lovely, like. But it, and we, we've had we've had some some good little moves in preseason like that. As I say, I think the bigger worry is like Allison is going to give away a couple of goals with with doing that. But he did anyway. You know, it's not like uh, yeah, it's just yeah, it's a, it's yeah. it's like a risk reward yeah. situation. You want to play like that. A case it's going to go wrong, yeah. and you just have to hope it goes wrong in a game where you win like three one or something, and yeah. it doesn't matter. Um, uh, the other the other the midfield, midfield, that's that's the to problem. Me is going to be the same as your dad. You know, he, he won't like it either. You know when they play that ball into a midfielder who's got a man on his back and then he's got to play that pass like perfectly or we're in trouble. And that's the thing that we've got to get used to. And I think part of that is just to do with the player who's getting the ball has got to know exactly where everybody else around him is going to be in that particular moment. And if one of those players is not if he's like a couple of yards away from where he's supposed to be and you're playing a blind pass around the corner, which is what Curtis has tried to do a few times you're going to get caught, but you just think that that's hopefully something that it, with, with like work on the training ground, it just becomes yeah, second nature. Yeah, he's drilling them, yeah. isn't he? So, you, so you, are, you, you are going to have those issues and it's happened in pre-season a lot, but you would expect it to be happening in pre-season as the, they're still adapting to it. Yeah. So, yeah. But I do think there's going to be times w when that happens and people are going to lose the shit over it, but it's just, that's like a, a, a natural consequence of if you're going to play like that. Although saying that, it's, does Man City ever get caught out like that? I can never remember them giving goals away. Very where, like, rarely, the, very other rarely. than against us in our absolute heyday when we were swarming all over them. But teams are more circumspect yeah, against them. Nobody aren't they? seems to be able team, to catch them playing kind of around. Like, yeah. So maybe it's just you know, the case just do it from, better, as you sorry. said, Paul. Like you know, it, it, it's not change yeah, what you do; that, just do it better. That's what he'll do, isn't it? I think. Um, just another quick takeaway from pre-season, Chris, and um, yeah. I hope I'm not tempted to fate, but I don't think I am because it was touted as being, a, you know, know what you're going to say. A thing from Arnold Slot. Yeah. There's no injuries. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we're, we're, we're the, the whole squad is fit as we as the season's yeah. about to start. And 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 to be fair, it was said that he is over the last couple of years he had a really good record with his squad at Feyenoord for the same thing. So that that's got that's got to be a good thing. And uh, long may that yeah. continue. I was just thinking about that, Dave, when mm-hmm. you were talking about Jota. It's unheard of for and, us you know, to be he, in this situation if, now. Absolutely. If he can if he can make a player like Jota available for you know even. Seventy-five percent of the games this season. That that could be mm. quite decisive in, in in how the campaign Especially goes. Especially in the so, running. Well, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, I think it's going to be one of those things. For me, there are three things that we're going to need this season um, to be successful. Bearing in mind the fact that there aren't major reinforcements coming in in, in positions where we've all identified um, we would like to see. Like, and the first thing in that is we're going to have to be really, really fortunate with injuries. Like, Robbo has become more injury prone in the last couple of mm-hmm. seasons. Like, Jota, as you mentioned, like he needs an interrupt- uninterrupted season. I think basically just training with Portugal all summer and staying fit while Ronaldo hogged all the limelight could help him. And he could hit the ground running and he's, he could be in really good physical shape, get in a little bit of a rhythm. Canate needs to be sorted out, stopping all of the little, the little, by weekly knocks he needs to he seems to pick up you know Curtis. Allison has to come yeah. Curtis, Curtis yeah Allison is fragile Salah needs to be uh, in, invulnerable That's again like we can't Salah, sustain any he did get that injury last year is that the start yeah. of father time catching up with him or was he just he just happened to get a hamstring because he yeah. looks in fucking phenomenal shape now he does, yeah. he's yeah, looked he does, so sharp he? since he's come back but yeah it will be interesting if he's if he can stay like the way he's always been, where he's just like Iron Man, never gets injured. Yeah, and I think just think the other two things, which we'll come into in more detail later, is that there was all this talk about the um, the, the brilliant squad that that Slot has inherited, and the fact that it's difficult to improve on that. Something which we will come to as well. Um, it's definitely a point worth discussing. But we're also going to need a lot of those players to kick on again this season, like Sobislay, yeah. Nunez, Gravenberch, yeah. Gakpo, Diaz, Kanate, Jones. They're all going to have to up their level a little bit yeah. and become what we hope they can yeah. be and if that happens and if people can stay injured injury free and if the young players who came in and showed immense promise over the last couple of years bradley kwanza bachetic can continue their upward trajectory then all of that all of that is absolutely true like we do have a really strong squad that is definitely um capable of of um challenging for all the major honours with a good man at the helm but a lot of things have to happen and fall into place for, I think for that to be the case mm-hmm. yeah agreed yeah. no that's a good point um, so should we talk about some of the transfer stuff a little bit then or the the absence yes, sir. the absence of yeah. it most notably um, the Zuba Mendy stuff Paul uh, which we heard of God, it feels like forever ago now that we were we were making the move for him. The uh, the release clause was going to be activated, and although he'd rejected advances from other big clubs to leave Sociedad, there were indications that he would be up for the move. Um, tellingly, it turns out that he wasn't. He's staying. We don't have any alternative targets to come in and fulfil that position. Um, I know this is something that you've been vocal about on Twitter in the last couple of days. So, uh, so have at it. I mean. In terms of the player himself, even the position, you know, Dave said, has been saying throughout the summer, that, you know, it's not the... In fact, Dave said he wouldn't strengthen at all. He'd be happy to start the season and and just go with what we've got and and let it play out with some of the young lads. I was open-minded. I think think we all were aware of positions where there are question marks. I think there's probably three that most people have talked about, you know, sort of maybe a a centre-half, a a number six, and maybe a a sort of a a new Mo. But I've not felt like it's desperate in any of those positions, particularly. Excuse me. Then this link comes along, and I think to myself, okay, that makes sense. Um, Slot wants to use the centre of midfield differently. He wants somebody who can do what 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 he's looking for there which is to uh, take receive the ball from the back line break the press and get us going the other way and that requires a specific skill uh, specific skill set which is different to certainly what endo for example has has, uh, has shown um <coughs> sorry excuse me um i didn't know a huge amount about the player uh, certainly what i've looked at makes sense looks good seen some clips of him seen some of the bits and pieces that he's that he's done for seville and for spain all of that makes sense. Um, even the fact that the deal has fallen through, don't have a massive problem with. You know, it's it's not exactly the same scenario, but shades of Stevie and Chelsea. 
you know, there's the, the boyhood loyalty thing. I, I can I understand that. I mean, I've seen, seen some people say things like, "Oh, where's his ambition? Um, what? Why is he make keeping Liverpool waiting when Liverpool come call and everyone should drop everything and come?" No, I just don't buy that. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. that's just that's no, just sorry. arrogant bullshit. You know, I just it's 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 almost a childish argument, really. That I think. I mean, it, you know, well, we project yeah. our view of the club onto these young lads yeah. from abroad yeah. who. If he'd only come been on. there a couple of years, so he'd gone there as a step up, up the ladder, and then he's looking for the next step up. Then that applies. Then I feel, but not when like that's his team. No, he's agree. His whole life, and agree. that's where he so, grew up. I t- totally, totally, boys agree with both of you there. I mean, I think so. So once we accept that that deal isn't happening for whatever reason, I, I believe what the journalists are saying that that Hughes have been told categorically that he wants to come. I think that's the case. And I think he has just got the jitters once it became a reality. I think some of it is... I think that Seville have been quite... Uh, sorry. So she have been quite quite clever in terms of how they've played it. You know, the way the... Um, the buy, It's not a release clause, it's a buyout clause, which is a, a, a legal requirement in Spain for all footballers' contracts. And the footballer has to pay the money to the Spanish FA. They then give it to the, to the club and he, he comes out of his contract and all players have to have one by law in the contract. But the difference is it places the onus on the player to request the transfer. So you, they can still negotiate a transfer outside of that clause if they want to. But Sociedad basically said, no, we're not going to do that. If you want to leave, you've got to tell us that you want to leave and you've got to do, do it this way. So that, they were quite clever in terms of the way they put the pressure the on The tax it. issue as well, though, Paul. If, like, if we yeah, give them the money yeah, for I believe the buyout, so, yeah. it gets taxed on that. And mm-hmm. so yeah, it's that's right. But I, it is complicated, yeah. But, what, but I, I kind of accept everything they've said about that my problem is not it's not great that that's fallen through but I think they can only they've got a relationship with an agent it's obviously in the agent's interest to move his player on he gets more money if his player signs a new contract that uh, moves forward rather than if he just um, he just stays where he is and signs a, signs a little bit of a bigger deal at the club he's at my problem is what's happened afterwards and the thing that I've got the problem with is there's nobody available who make, who's better than what we've got now I'm, I'm sorry I just don't believe there's nobody there are players who are better of course there are players who are better Manchester City I've got Rodri Arsenal I've got Declan Rice you could go through all kinds there are players there my question mark around this use of the word available this is the club flex their muscles enough it's really my one gripe about the way the club has largely done its transfer business. I, I, I think self-sufficiency thing, brilliant, love it. The fact they won't overpay, the fact they look for value, all of those things. But the com- there occasionally comes a point where you have to flex your muscles if you want to improve. Sometimes you can't just get a player with a buyout clause so you don't have to de- negotiate with the club. Sometimes you can't find a club in a difficult situation where they need to sell and so they're open to taking a lower offer than they'd really like to accept. Sometimes you have to go after a player where the club doesn't want to sell at all. And that requires, you know, a bit of flexing of the muscles. That requires spending some money. We did it with Virgil. Southampton didn't want to sell. A long time ago now, by the way. Southampton didn't want to sell. We upset them in the way we went about it. Eventually we got the deal done and we paid a world record fee for a centre-half. And we got it done. I'm not advocating that in every single transfer. But for me, it looks to me as though they're now falling into almost an ideological position about transfers rather than a principled one. And if I just be clear about what I mean by that, for me, the reason I prefer principles over ideology is that ideology is absolutely rigid and doesn't bend ever for anything or anyone. But I'm a little bit more pragmatic than that. I think we should have very clear principles about how we want to operate and we broadly stick to them. But occasionally circumstances dictate that we have to, um, we have to go a slightly different route. Now, mm-hmm. I'll give you an example just, just, to, just to illustrate. I'm not advocating this player at all. But let's say, for example, we wanted um, Bruno, the, the lad at, at Newcastle. Maybe we thought he was, he was the one for this. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's played for this position under slot. He's played in the Premier League. Um, He's Newcastle star player. We know they don't want to lose him. He's really integral to how they play, but we also know that they've struggled a little bit financially and with that they apparently are open to selling a star player because they got into a conversation about Anthony Gordon. Let's say we thought that was the player. There will be a price at which Newcastle would sell. Now, we don't know that price unless we have a conversation. 
But there's kind of an assumption that we don't even want to open those conversations. Another example, we wanted Chua many two seasons ago, and this could and let's just reflect again that this is not a short term issue, someone in this position. We're now into our third summer where we tried for players and not got them. We wanted Chua many two two summers ago. Didn't get him, he went to Madrid. Okay, that ship sailed. He hasn't been an ever present for Madrid. Have we even explored the idea of going back for him? Yes, he might not want to leave Real Madrid. But Real Madrid might say, do you know what? We've just signed Mbappe. We need to make a little bit more space. We don't know what their circumstances are, but is it worth the question? These players could be available if you, if you ask the question and you're prepared to back it up with a bit of muscle. And it just seems to me that we won't do that. Stu, is, Stu always makes the point that there's, there's almost certainly always somewhere out there off the data in the, the less fancy leagues who have got real potential and are very much a bargain. But if, if, you're, talk, well. if you're talking about, and I'm sure, I've no doubt that is correct, by the way, mm-hmm. but if you're talking about you wanting to take a team that's got all this potential, finish third, we want to realise that potential, and maybe what we actually need is a little bit more nous and leadership. Premiership ready has worked well for us in the past under Klopp when we signed Sadio, we signed, or oh, list them all, you know, Gini Wijnaldum, Robbo, Virgil. Loads of players came from Premier League teams and came in and hit the ground running. So if that's what we want, why not have a little look at doing that yeah. sort of business? But to me, they are, they're too rigid around this point. And I don't think it's a, I, I, it's not about being tight. I just think they're overly focused on their, on their, what has become a bit of an ideology and ideologies just don't work for me it's about principles and principles allow you to be a little bit flexible in your approach when the situation dictates so if they feel if Slot feels that he really needs a specific type of player for this number six I think they should do what they can to get it for him um, and that's my frustration I'm not someone who's into this whole FSG penny pinching narrative I just think that's bullshit and it's childish I know, I know I'm in the minority I know loads of people think the opposite um, but I'm sorry, that's just, that's just my view. I've been consistent in that view for years and years and years. I wanted this approach before FSG took us over. But sometimes you've got to say, we're Liverpool, we're elite. And also financially, we're probably in the best shape of any club in the Premier League that hasn't cheated to go and flex our muscles financially. You know, we've got big spenders off the books. Um, we've spent well within our, within our means for, for a number of years. We've got the headroom to spend big. So why not have a go? This idea that these players aren't available, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. And that's my frustration. For me, for me, Paul, I completely agree with, with, with everything you said there. But Stu's point, I think, is, qu- is quite important as well. And, um, you know, this really strong squad thing where you say that it's, people are saying it's difficult to improve upon. The availability thing is obviously one issue. But the way that those fellas with the laptops pitch themselves Edwards and Hughes and Ward and all those guys like you wouldn't think that these lads have the best databases analytical models player profiling and identification technology in world football you know coupled with the lure of Liverpool Football Club Champions League football um, the the money that the Premier League brings in terms of just raising your profile mm. as a footballer like you the know, money we can pay, think, we can pay high, high money exactly. as well, wages. Like, you'd think the way that these lads act in terms of, like, saying that they're, you know, it's hard to identify these players who can exclude, improve the squad. Yeah, it is hard if you're the likes of me, you and Dave, who don't watch that much football outside of Liverpool and the Premier yeah. League, and then we tune into a summer tournament and see somebody fancy, like a flash Italian with nice hair, and say, go and get him, and then get pissed off when he goes to Arsenal or goes elsewhere. Like... This is why this is what you guys are supposed to be all about. This is like the the model that you have brought to the fore. This is why you're supposed to be ahead of the pack. So if you're not going to um, pay the big money and get the flashy signing that comes in and instantly improves the first eleven, why are you doing fuck all else? Yeah. So I don't disagree with anything Paul said. I wholeheartedly agree with most of it. I do think there's an element of FSG not wanting to spend money. I think that comes into it to a certain extent, not not to the degree where you know fans are constantly kicking off about it. But um, there is a responsibility on them. You know, it is partly down to them. About them, Klopp referred to them as being careful, didn't he? Um, overly cautious or something, and he'd like to take more risks. So that is obviously comes from the top to some extent. But I agree with everything you're saying there about if you can't get that player, well then, there's plenty of other players out there. Don't give me this. It's impossible to to find people who are available and better than what we've got. I don't buy it. Now, 
I was not bothered about whether we signed anyone or not. If we if we went in with what we've got, I'd be fine with that. And the main reason for that, it's it's funny. I don't I don't normally go into a summer thinking that way, but last summer, kind of there's a lesson to be learned there. I think, with Quonset and Bradley, if you go back a year, nobody thought for one second they would have the impact that they had, and that's what's sticking with me. I'm like the reason they had that impact was because he got opportunity. You know, nobody was talking them up. Bradley, to some extent, because he did so well, but it was in League One. Like, as well as he did, he was playing in League One. Nobody expected him to come in and just look incredible. And Quonset was, like, one of the biggest surprise packages I can ever remember. Nobody talked him up at all. And you look at him and you're like, he's so fucking good. He's, like, he's really, really, really good. And he's 21. So I'm looking at, at that and I'm like, well... Tyler Morton's done really well in the championship. And if you look at the teams who are supposedly interested in Tyler Morton, it's not that he's he's getting linked at all like championship clubs. It's teams abroad. Feyenoord are one of the teams supposed to be looking at him. Um, there's an Italian team. Can't remember. I think it might have been Atalanta. I don't know. He's been linked with like some pretty good caliber clubs, like Champions League, Europa League standard clubs. So he's not like it's. He just he could be the next Bradley. You just don't know the next Quonset, but he would need the opportunity to show it. So my view is that I wouldn't be writing any of these lads off who've who've looked, who've played and have looked good, like, you know, potentially good. We don't know what they could do if they were given the opportunity. So, and there's more, there's layers to this, which we need to get to in terms of, we'll talk about it later, but players who are supposedly up for sale, like to Ben Doak, Bobby Clark, we'll get to that later. Uh, But what I was saying is, so I wasn't bothered about signing anyone but that's also on the condition that well we don't sell Joe Gomez we keep Sepp Vandenberg you know if, if those players go then you've, you've got to go out and buy somebody what I'm saying is I would not be in like a, a massive hurry to just go and buy players to then get rid of these other players who we've got so I was fine with that but also it was on the condition that they sort out the new contracts for Trent and Virgil and mm. Mo's a slightly different case because we don't know Mo's plans. We don't know like the the salary that he'll be wanting and that needs to play out over the season, I think, before you make a decision on that. But Trent and Virgil, that should have been top of the to-do list the second that Edwards came back and Hughes started his job. And look how far down the line we are now. And Virgil's saying that they've not they're not even talking to him. He's, he's, he hasn't even he said he hasn't even had like talks about a contract. They've made no progress. That worries me massively because I'm thinking, what the hell have they actually been doing since they come back? If you're not signing players, that's one thing. But you're not even getting the, the players you've got tied down. So that's my big problem with them is that we're going into the season and those contracts haven't been sorted. Now, hopefully before we play Ipswich, they make an announcement. Oh, yeah, Trent signed and all that. And then it's, yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's all done. But as of now, it's like you're not signing players. You're selling some of like the, the, the promising kids and you're not getting new contracts. So we also need to talk about the goalkeeper doing? situation as well. We, we'll get onto that with like the, the potential new keeper who's coming and what that means. Because we could be looking in 12 months' time, we're saying bye to Trent, Virgil, Mo, Allison, And then what are we mm-hmm. going to get then when it, t- when it comes to spending? And like we're, we're going to be getting all of this shit again about, you know, oh, well, we've only got enough money to do this because we're not getting any transfer fees for most of them. We don't know what would happen with Allison, But... You're gonna lose like massive players for you, and you've got to replace well, those players. players. Well, where do you where are you getting the money from to do that if you can't even do deals now? So there's massive question marks over that, and it starts with me with the contracts. The fact that they have not done those contracts is mind blowing to me. I'm like, what are you thinking? How are you? And me, me, Paul, we argued about this months ago on the pod. And I think, Chris, you said, how will you feel, Paul, if we go into August, we go into the first game, and Trent's still not got a contract, and here we are. You know, they still haven't sorted it. Why? Why? Yeah, why I mean, I think, Johnny? I think... Well, I, we, we don't know, do we? We'll speculate. Know. Why, I mean, I think, why do you think that that's I think, not happened? I think... Um, I, I think I said... I can't remember exactly what I said at the time, but I think I said if we went into the season, I'd be I'd start to become more worried. I mean, there is an element with me, I'm always like this, I worry about it when it becomes a problem, you know what I mean? I, I kind of like, just because... I am mindful of the fact that we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And also, maybe just my own experience of, of you know, of like sort of 
turmoil in organisations and changes of leadership and what have you. I know how it makes everybody drop the ball to a certain degree. Now, that doesn't excuse, but it explains. You know, and you've got Hughes didn't start until the 1st of June. We can all say, oh, yeah, but he'd be getting on with it behind the scenes. To a degree, but he's not in the same way that he can go completely hands-on, where everyone in football is basically saying, oh, yeah, Richard Hughes is running things there. Um, I think... On those, the, the contract is now starting to become concerning. Paulo, just on that, I it think... was reported that while he was seeing out his, his time at Bournemouth, Bournemouth had, had agreed that he could be doing stuff for Liverpool as well. I didn't yeah, see it, that. It was, right. okay. they, they had an arrangement I mean, where, you know, in terms of scouting I mean, it, players it, and all, all of that stuff. It, it, either way, my point about structural change and, and leadership change, I think, is a valid one. I know it's not interesting to most people. I know most people don't care. But organisational structures do affect the way everybody does their jobs and they can get in the way. Communication lines aren't there. No one knows who's making the decision. Things get blurred and then people drop the ball. That is, that's an absolute fact of organisational leadership. That, that all said, what is a bigger fucking priority than your most saleable asset, which is Trent? Getting him tied down. Your vice captain. I mean, that is exactly. now. Yeah, I, I, that is that is now. I'm now. I've now moved from relaxed to concerned. I'm not in full panic mode because it just. And I suppose the reason why I'm not is because it just defies belief to me that they would let him go. It just doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make football and sense. It doesn't make sense on any level. And I also don't believe that he is desperate to go either. Nobody. So there all, might come so, a well, point. Hang on, Dave. Just hear me out. Just hear me out. I am. I'm aware of all the. The, all the what could the, the possibilities and the maybes but I'm just explaining my thinking to you that in my head I'm thinking this is so ridiculous that they must want him to sign now the fact that he hasn't at this stage is a little bit worrying I've come on to Virgil I think we're moving into the realm of being insulting with Virgil now because this is our captain he's one he's, well he's the best centre half I've ever seen play the game he's still an absolutely world class player I'm convinced he's got years ahead of him. Apart from when Pickford sort of committed GBH on him, his injury record is absolutely second to none. His fitness record is second to none. Um, at the very least, offer him, I don't know, 12, a roll in 12 months. I think that would be an insult. But get, get, it's, I think that would be such an easy deal to do. I think he would say, I mean, think about how positively he's talked about the club. That's an easy one to do. Mo, I, I take you. I agree with what you said before, Dave. We don't know what he wants, um, and that's maybe one where you wait until right near the end, and then you see how the land lies. Even though I would, I would happily give him another deal, um, albeit one weighted sort of in terms of you know um, clauses, and he's got to pay play a certain number of games or score goals or whatever. But yeah, I, I, I would, I would want all three of them to sign Trent and Verge are the two that have got me worried, and I don't know. Well, none of us know why. The other thing I'd say, though, is this comes back to all of this stuff, is that the absence of information makes us panic. But just because we haven't got the information doesn't mean the things aren't happening. I, I, but I do agree. It's, go, it's going a bit too far now. It, we do, you know, going into... Once the season started, there's less than a season until they can, they're all out the door for nothing. Um, and that's a concern. Even with the lack of information, just before you get onto that, Dave, but just to, on one point Paul made... Um, even with the lack of information, like in normal circumstances, we'd be getting whispers of, oh, you know, we want him to stay, like talks are ongoing. Just like the little things that you hear to sort mm -hmm. of set your mind at ease a little bit about like the fact that it, they are fucking doing it, but these things take time, you know, like, but the, the absence of that makes me worried. Yeah, like, I mean, it's, maybe... it's a lack of information com combined with a lack of external reassurance. I mean, I'm just speculating now, but on that specific point, Maybe they don't want a narrative out there that Liverpool are throwing massive wages at players as they're looking to sign other ones. I don't know, but it, 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 I agree. It's now, it is concerning. It's concerning. I just think on, that Dave, sorry. what I was going to say there, I'm not saying Trent's desperate to get away. We don't know what Trent's thinking. I'm not saying he's desperate to get away. What I am saying is there will come a point where if this drags on and you're Trent and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? I, I could just go yeah. to Real Madrid. Yeah, these, these are like dragging the heels they don't seem desperate to keep me they're not buying players that's another thing you know Virgil said after the game the other day yeah you know we need some players I'm sure that they're working hard and they'll get players in well if they don't what do you think the players are saying to each other about that you know and and then there's no contract like 
if I'm Trent, I would seriously be considering this now. As I say, you don't we you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. They might well be talking to Trent. They might be close. We don't know. What we do know is Virgil saying like, "No, we're not close. We're, we're not. We're not even. There's, it, there's no progress being made at all." So we know about that. We don't know about Trent because nobody's really said anything either way whether talks are taking place or I'd not. I'd be surprised if they're treating all three the same way. No. I think they'll have a different strategy for each of the three, and Trent has to be the number one priority. Yeah, he does. But with Virgil, you said about it being insulting and that, and I, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the is. only explanation for them not being in talks with Virgil and not trying to get this sorted is they're in, like, prove-yourself mode. We want to see how you do this year. Now, that is insulting, because look how he or did last squeeze, year. Squeeze the contract. Yeah, let's say, look how he did last year. He was the best centre-back in the league. Or, um, Arsenal fans will probably disagree. Their centre backs did have really good seasons, but whatever, you know, he's he's up there like in the conversation for best centre back in the league again. And he's thirty three, so the position he plays in, it's not that big a deal. Thiago Silva was still fucking brilliant when he was forty, still a quality player. So Virgil's got five years at the top at but least. But even me in the Premier I, I sort of agree, but even if you narrow that down and say, Okay, so three you can. You still would not be looking at him going. Oh, he's nearly finished. Maybe we don't want to do that. I. I, I agree that it's insulting. Yeah. I agree, and he's club captain as well. You know, he's the captain. He never misses games. His, his performance levels like exceptionally high. It, In a squad full of potential, without yeah, proving, and what, you know, with potential everywhere, and he's proven. We need more proven. And he, he's less. been like a great professional. He, he talks well. He's always like speaking about like his love for the club and all of that stuff and it's all genuine you know this is a fellow who yeah. turned down like clubs that were in a better position than us when he came here you know he, he had like everybody wanted him and he came here and i just i find it like incredible that like that that you know he's he's into his last year and they've not even started talks now it'll probably all sort this itself could... out and all that but that doesn't excuse how long it's taken that's my point here that's my beef with it all this could be uh, sort of one of the, there are a couple of examples this summer of um, perhaps the change of approach, the, uh, you know, the new era with the guys behind the scenes having more power than the manager who was, a, mm. you know, a force of personality and had all the power with the fans. Definitely. Not to, not to compare, you know, like Klopp would have had this sorted. It would have been one of his big priorities this summer to get these things sorted, to tie down the players that have been loyal to him, to tie down the players that he envisages mm -hmm. moving the club forward. Um, and we have we haven't seen that from from the new guy yet. Maybe because it's you know he's still getting his feet under the table. Like maybe it's because he's more of a he's less of a personality that's gonna that's gonna push back against that kind of thing because he's used to operating in that more broader management committee sort of thing. He's head rather coach, than a, not manager. It's yeah, his official title. Yeah, well, he doesn't have a yeah. say in you know doesn't have a say in contracts. Doesn't have a, he has less of a say in the players that we're gonna sign by all accounts. So. Um, you know, maybe this is just a sign of, you know, th this new era, and it's a reflection of how it's going to be with these lads, with Ward and Hughes and um, Edwards having all, all of the power in making these decisions. And we're we're probably because we're football people and we're passionate, aren't going to like nope. it for a lot of the time. The other, you know, the other thing I I thought of not to get to harp onto the Zubamendi stuff too t too much, but I wonder whether this was the first indication we've seen of the lack of um, ability to convince a player to sign for us when he's uh, sort of um, weighing up both of his options because you don't have that magnetic personality who can wrap an arm around a player and, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, and tell him, we're going to look after you, yeah. you'll think about this place as your new home, you'll love it here, like, I love it here, the people are amazing, the club isn't... Just to set, like, you know, in The Sopranos where... Um, like Richie April is trying to uh, move against Tony and he's got like Uncle Junior's backing and Uncle Junior realises that Richie couldn't sell it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not sure if Arna Slot has had it. He probably didn't even speak to Zuberman. He probably had no impact. But you know in that situation, we'd have, ha we'd have had Jürgen talking to the lads, you know, tr trying to reassure him that everything was going to work out for the better. And, you know, I guess it's just we're living in a different era yeah. now on a bunch of fronts and we're just going to have to get used to it. And then we're not going to like it. <laughs> You can subscribe to the Liverpool Way podcast on all the major platforms, whether it's Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon or Podbean. Just search for the Liverpool Way, leave us a review and hit subscribe to automatically receive all new episodes. You can also head to liverpoolway.co.uk and grab a TLW season ticket for just £3 a month. 
There's tons of exclusive content, including match reports from every Liverpool game, weekly Premier League roundups, the TLW diary, and access to the members only forum. Lastly, you can follow us on social media at the Liverpool Way on Twitter and at the Liverpool Way TLW on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I think on I think on one level, I think that those questions you just framed, then Chris, are completely to be expected. Really, I also think there's an element of them, and I the same the same questions have occurred to me. By the way, there's also an element of them being unfair, but I think it's it's not possible to see the club now any other way than through the prism of Jurgen because he's made it what it is. So we're we're inevitably going to be asking those questions. It's not Slot's fault that he's not club. No. But but we are going to inevitably ask those things those things of everything that doesn't quite go the way we want it. One thing that did occur to me as we were talking there about um, you know the manager who can sort of prize these players out of to convince these players to come and join us. Um, I believe that that slot. I saw an indication that slot did speak to Zubamendi. Um but I, I'm just minded of the fact that Roy Keane shook hands with Kenny to join Blackburn, um, and then went a different direction. And I don't think anyone could ever say that Kenny is a manager without pulling power. Um, so it, so these things can happen. And I think I just think we all of us, and I'm, I'm telling myself as much as anything, need to be mindful to not overthink these things and to see the worst in every situation. But I also think these questions are inevitable until we see evidence to the contrary. We all naturally are dubious about what follows Jürgen Klopp um, because he's the greatest, isn't he? So I think until we start to see better football, successful transfers, see the thing working. These comparisons um, are just an absolute inevitability right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 the key thing is, is that the new people involved have got to show that they deserve to be doing their jobs. I mean, I must say, final point on, 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 on the, the nerds for me is that I, I just... There, there, is some, there is some wisdom in the whole we take, data takes the emotion out of these decisions. That, that does make sense. And that's been borne out lots and lots of times. But I think some of them can tip over the other way and, 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 and sort of, you know, they get, get to become the chin strokey side of these things where they just seem to think that they know better than anybody, that there isn't, that the human factor isn't important. You can never, ever, ever, no matter what the data says, move away from the fact that you are talking about human beings and how they interact with each other and how they get along with each other and how they operate together as a collective. There's no spreadsheet in the world that ultimately tells you that and I think some of them are maybe in danger of just being too focused on all the numbers everything you read about Michael Edwards says he's actually despite the cliche he's not the data man he's the man who um, employs the data man and he's mindful of the fact that you need to look at all that other stuff the soft skills and all the rest of it but I just I don't know Hughes is an unknown quantity to us all isn't he and you know, I think I, I, I just why fear is that they're all just sitting around patting themselves on the back, saying how clever they are about not overpaying for this player and finding this un, unseen gem. When sometimes you just sometimes you just need to say that's the player we want. How are we going to get it done? Well, what they do is they they look and go, that's the player we want. Has he got a clause? No. Okay. Forget it. Exactly. We just seem to want that's, to just do deals with players with clauses. That comes back to my point now. about how they perceive availability. Yeah. Just their view of availability and mine are different. One things. final quick point about Dubamendi that I didn't make before when I was saying about like I'm quite happy to not sign players and all that stuff. It doesn't matter what I think. Bottom line was Slots decided he needs a number six who plays the style of football that he wants to play, and it's pretty obvious from preseason that. That's not Endo. He's, he's he's hardly played Endo. Endo's got up until like the weekend. Endo played less minutes in preseason than Trey Nioni, so it tells you all you need to know really about like what what role he sees for Endo. So if he's mm-hmm. decided and that, that Endo's a, Endo's a really good player, but he's he's got certain strengths and certain weaknesses, and it's not a strength having the ball played into his feet, facing his own goal under pressure. That, and that's what our midfield players are, are going to be expected to do. Now, that's a strength of McAllister. To some extent, it's a strength of Jones. It's not a strength of Endo. So if Slot's decided, I need a number six who plays a specific way, and I don't think he wants like the 
the destroyer type that like a lot of fans want. You know, like the mobile tackling machine. Yeah. I don't think that's what he's looking for. I think Fabinho. Yeah, yeah. I think he wants like you know a, maybe a Thiago type player more than anything else. You know, someone who'll just can receive the ball under pressure, won't lose it, will keep it, will get us moving. He's looking for that type of of six. So regardless of like what fans want, well, some fans want like a tackling machine. I'm not bothered about that anyway. That doesn't matter. Your manager wants you. Well, your head coach wants a certain type of player that he feels we either don't have or we don't have enough of and it's their job to go out and get it for him it's simple as that it's mm-hmm. like that's your job is to yeah. go and get what he needs and to get to go for one player miss out and then if the reports are to be believed it's like well you know that's it that it was it was him or nobody and you know we just yeah. have to get on with it that's that's not good it's a case of the more things change, the more they stay the same, though, isn't it? As Paul, as you mentioned, this is the third season we're going mm. into where we're looking to improve upon this position. And, and every season we've had the sort of same thing where we get somebody pitched to us who can fulfill this role. Like it was last year, I think it was Curtis. Like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe Curtis can do the job as the number six. So yeah, ironically, this year, maybe he can because of the, the style yeah. of play is different. But, you know, th- last year we ended up w- not wasting because he did OK, really, uh, just a testament to how good a player is. But we wasted half a season of Alexis McAllister's, um, mm. like, potential. Like, we saw the difference in him when he moved into his proper position. He was he went from being a, a, a really valuable player in the team to arguably being the best player in the second half of the season for us. He's phenomenal. Yeah. And then this summer we're, we're we're getting the name we're seeing play there is like Gravenberch. Mm. Like like how would you feel as going into the season with that as our primary option in in that position? Not great, but it remains to be seen. He may well be a revelation in that position. We've seen it before where players have been moved into a different role. I mean, the obvious one that comes to mind is Wijnaldum, totally mm. transformed from what he was for Holland and for Newcastle and did a totally different job for us and was brilliant, like vital cog in the machine. Maybe Gravenberg's got that in him to do it. I don't know. I'd be doubtful at this point, but we've not seen enough of it. Um, we may well see a lot of it if we don't sign anyone. You know, he's got, They might even put Sobers Light Deeper as well. That's another option to, to do that. But none of this is what Slot ideally wants to do, which is, mm-hmm. that's the problem. It's like... He's making do. He's like, okay, well, that's the best option I've got. It might not necessarily be yeah. the option I want, but it, you know, I'll make do with what I've got. Also, some of these players are lads I'm not totally convinced by anyway. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm, well, I'm, I'm prove, not totally convinced by Gravenberg. I'm not totally convinced by Sobers yeah. Light. I'm not slagging them. I'm not saying they're crap. But I'm just saying, you know, these are lads where I'm not thinking, yeah, you, you're a first team They're player. not McAllister. So, no, and that exactly. also goes for Curtis as well, by the way, who I really like. He's still got something to prove I think McAllister's the only one who you're like 100% yeah he's top quality you can rely on Mm -hmm. him you know you're going to get week in week out good performances the others have still got to take it up a level and prove themselves I got to see McAllister in the the Copa America final like live I covered that a few weeks back and my god like it it wasn't talked about very much but he was just the best player on the pitch Mm -hmm. Like amidst all that talent in that Argentina team, and Colombia has some really talented players as well. But like, he's what absolutely makes that Argentina team tick. Even with you know your Messi's and your Endos and all the all the class that they have in that, he was <laughs> Enzo. Um, Enzo. <laughs> Enzo. Did I say yeah. Endo? Sorry. Yeah. Enzo. Big difference there. <laughs> well, not really. Really, like <laughs> you can argue that Endo was a better signing than yeah. Enzo was. Last year, so uh, his, his game has developed rapidly and come a long way in two years, hasn't it? Yeah, oh, he's yeah, so good. Love him again. That you know, that's a good point, that Paul, because again, it ties in with what I was saying earlier, which we need to talk about is about like making decisions on these young players. It's like, mm. McAllister was like when he first went to Brighton, he was he was a number ten, and he, he looked he had his moments. He seen like a few highlights of him on match of the day, and thought oh, that was decent, but he he, he wasn't like. And they set his brilliant. release calls at 30, didn't they? So that tells you what they thought yeah, of him, was, the it, level he was at. He, he outplayed that like very quickly. He just he just yeah. kicked on massively. And players can do that. And you know, we've seen it with, with Quanser and Bradley. We may as well get to this point now about like the Bobby Clark and Ben Doak. Yeah, and lay, lay it out, Dave. Lay it all out. My whole problem with this, I've seen people saying, Well, Bobby Clark's probably not gonna make it here. If you can get ten million, good. Well, okay. Tyler Morton's valuation at the moment is twenty million. Because he had he had a couple of years out on loan. Why would you be selling Bobby Clark now at nineteen for ten million quid? Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense to me. 
Like he, Bobby Clark may end up being like a, a League One Championship player. We don't know, and that's the whole point. We don't know. So if you go back twelve months, what would happen if somebody had to come in and offer us ten million for Quanser or Bradley? Would Richard Hughes have been like, yeah, yeah, I'll take that, yeah. That's good for PSR, selling academy players, you know, it's good for the books. Is that how they would have looked at it? Because, like I say, you know, it probably wouldn't have happened because Klopp and Linders <laughs> were calling the shots and Linders mm -hmm. actually said to Klopp he'd stake his entire reputation. I think he said, I'll give a year's salary or something if... No, that was with Trent in the inverted thing, wasn't it? He? he said something about, like, you know, uh, I'll, I'll stake my career on Conor Bradley you know, making it, that's how much I believe in him. But very few other people were looking at it like that because you don't know. Inglethorpe's done some really good interviews about this where he's actually admitted now, he said, I've given up looking at, like, kids coming through and identifying who's going to make it and who isn't. He said, because you just do not know until they get to 2021. And he said, and even then, sometimes you're not sure. And he said, because they just develop at different rates. And he used Jaden Dans as an example, because he said Jaden Dans was not even getting in the under-18 team. And then all of a sudden, he just exploded. And he said, like, he, he phoned up uh, Linders or, like, messaged him, whatever. And he said, you need to take a look at him, because I don't know if I'm wrong. Like, I think he looks special now. But it's kind of come from nowhere. I need you to take a look at him and I want want to see your opinion. So he goes up to Melwood. He starts training and within three weeks he's playing in a cup final and he's starting FA Cup games and that. But Inglethorpe's like, he was not someone who we were talking about. And he, he, he mentions Harry Kane because he worked with Harry Kane when he was at Tottenham's Academy. And he said Harry Kane was in the bottom half of the group when he was like 16, 17, 18. He said, and then... Went to Kidderminster, yeah, and then, didn't he? Yeah, Elite in Orient, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I think he had a couple of loans, but but his point was you just don't know because sometimes a player surprises you and he just explodes and just becomes phenomenal. Whereas a lot of the time, like the best eighteen-year-olds in the country, by the time they get to twenty-one, they're like you know they're playing in like League One. It, they don't always progress. So that's my whole point about Ben Doak and uh, and Bobby Clark. Loan them out by all means. You know, even if you loan them out for two, three years and you make the decision when they're twenty-one, twenty-two. Do not be making decisions on them kids now just because you're thinking, ah, oh, it's all right, we can get like 10 million. And that, because he's an academy player, that's 10 million on this year's like PSR, especially when you're yeah. not fucking spending anything anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah we didn't need I mean, to worry think, about that at all. Yeah. I think that, that, that does, I, I think that that's very valid what you've said there, Dave. I think, you know, particularly the thing that res you, you made this point in the chat earlier this week, I think, and the, the point that the, the two names that really resonated with me were Connor Bradley and especially Jarrell Quonsa. You know that you, that's absolutely spot on. It like that, that kind of um, illustrates your point perfectly. I think I suppose my my response would be I said this a few times last season. We haven't really got our our flow of sales going properly again since COVID, and that was what we based all our trans much of our transfer success on. We were really good at selling players. Maybe even better at selling players than we were at signing no, we them. Were. And I think at mm -hmm. some point, you've got to get that going again. Now, obviously, that begs the question, who? I think the other the other thing that really struck me this summer, I mean, we, we also probably need to do very briefly refer to the, the, the whole um, amortisation thing and financial fair play and PSR and all of that. It is advantageous to sell young players that you didn't sign for a transfer fee. But the other thing that struck me from this summer is that that point that was quoted in a totally different context about the preseason, where it was said that um, you know Slot had taken thirty-two players away with him, and he still had nine first-team senior players to come back. So that's forty-one players, and just numbers-wise, that's too many. Some need to go now. Some of those players are players where we all—it's generally accepted anyway—that their Liverpool careers have come to an end. People like, you know, a fella I'll always remember fondly, Nat Phillips. Mm -hmm. Also, there's players in there who maybe are at a crossroads in their career and really want to step up and make their own way in the world, like Cueve. Vandenberg. Um, Va Vandenberg, Tyler yeah. Moore, so, so those sorts of players you can see moving on for different reasons and justifying it. And But then you still come back to the fact that there's all these kids. Now, you could argue that some of them have to go back to the 21s, some have to go back to the 18s, but also you, we've heard little whispers that there's a great crop coming through from the 16s. You, there needs to be room for them. I'm comfortable 
with the caveat that you've made, the point you've made there, we don't know how they'll turn out. I'm comfortable if we sell some of these players as long as we do what we've done pretty well, which is put the right clauses in. So we sell them now, but we put a, a buyback in. We put a, an add-on, you know, a, a, a sell-on clause in there, and we give ourselves ways of mitigating the risk that we've sold the wrong player, that we've either sold somebody who is worth more than we sold them for, and we want a slice of that because we haven't got a position to bring him back, or Thanks, we've so- <clears throat> yeah, or we've sold him and we thought, oh shit, we've really we've got a space for him now, and we know he fits, and he's kicked on at that club. Let's get him back. And I'll, we, we have to pay like a, a little bit extra to thank the club who've, who've done the development for us that we couldn't do. So as long as we cover ourselves that way, there will be players that we've all got a soft spot for that go. Now, I have to say, having said all of that, if Jaden Dans is sold, I'm going to fucking riot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am going to fucking riot. However... All of the others, I mean, Bobby Clark, I thought, you know, he came out of nowhere and really surprised me last season. But I don't feel strongly about the fact we might sell him. Ben Doak, the same. None of these lads, as long as we put the clauses in like we've done with Cavalio. I think we all probably agree that Cavalio, despite all the noises about a great preseason, was not really for Liverpool. But he's 21, I think he's that's probably... my point, Paul. You, you can yeah, make that and, decision. And also quite... yeah, absolutely, Dave, absolutely. And I do, do say your point, I've, I've said. I do, it's a good point, I accept it. But I think there has to be a pragmatic element to this in terms that some of these players have got to go for financial reasons, for developmental reasons, and just in terms of our reputation of of getting the the whole you know the selling selling high thing going again. You know we've got to start doing these deals. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm broadly okay with it um, as long as we cover ourselves and mitigate the risk with with the right clauses in these contracts. But the selling high right now, Paul, rather than so, sorry, just quickly the selling high that that's all well and good for Vandenberg. Tyler Morton, they're all valued at like twenty million quid. Queeve, that's fine, and um, that makes sense. That you know they're at an age where you like you've got to make a decision, one way or another. And if you're going to sell them and you're getting like twenty million for them, that's that's fine. That's how you should do it. I don't think we should be selling teenagers, especially when it's like ten million quid. That's not selling high, you know. I just and, and it's the message it sends out as well. Maybe like Bobby maybe. Clark, how, for example. How many games has Bobby Clark played for that, Liverpool? I don't know. I'm no, asking. Not not that many. That's not my point. The, the point is. Because twelve million is decent if he's played less than fewer it's not than twenty games. Not not for the for the age that he is. Maybe. Loan him out, let him Maybe. play games elsewhere, and then and then look what see what his value is. That that's my whole argument with it. Same with Ben Doak. He's not played that many games for us. But I guess they're thinking they just need to sell someone. And Why? if there's interest in Bobby Clark. Why? Why do they need to get the to get the ball rolling to start bringing money in as well as but money not out? Spend because that is the model. They need to bring money in. And they've got other players because who we've, some, we've at said. At some point, they're going Car- to. We've, we've just brought in happen. 25 million for, for Carvalho. Um, we'll get money for Cueve if he goes. They're talking like there's teams interested in Vandenberg. We want 20 million. We may well not get that. But if we sell him, you've then got to go and buy a centre back anyway. So it kind of makes sense to just make him stay unless he's going to be kicking off about it, which he might based on like things he said. But I, that, what I'm saying is like. These when when the players you're bringing these players from other clubs so like Bobby Clark we persuaded him to leave Newcastle when he was like 16 so he comes here there's loads of others like James McConnell was at Sunderland we're like no no come here there's a pathway for you you'll come through and they did there was a pathway you know because you had Vito Matos and you had Pep Linders bringing these players up coaching them up integrating them with the first team squad they play in the cup games they're there when we've got injuries you know you know they did a great job for us and it feels like now. It's like, yeah, we, we just see them as like, oh, we can get 10 million for him, we'll move him on. Well, there'll be a knock on effect down the line if you keep doing that. Like, why is Bobby Clark going to leave Newcastle to come here to then be sold? I mean, why I, would you do it? You'd stay with it. Dep- the, it dep- we, we need to see how it plays out, don't we? And you may well be right. You I'm may just well saying, be right. I don't like the, side, the, the, the message it ends. That's all. I, it may well play maybe, out fine, I, but no, as of now, I, I don't like as it. As I'm saying, Dave. Maybe, maybe you're right, but also maybe there's an also for some players there's a development angle to it. Maybe there's more jeopardy in a sale rather than a loan. Maybe some players are not really motivated by a loan. Maybe I don't know. I and mean, we can overthink this, can't mm. we? Like I said, as long as we've got clauses in there to protect us, then I'm all right with it. Apart from Jaden Downs. Mm-hmm. See, Ben Doak would be my Jaden Downs. I think he could be really good. He's got to improve his end product, no question about too it. Too slight for me. Too but too small. There's something there, like, you know, he's, he's talented. And even if he's not going to make it here, he looks like someone who he could tear it up on loan and you'd get good money for him when he's 20. 
21. Why? Don't you think, think he looks a little he moody, fucker? He does. He's, he never smiles or no laughs. But we don't know that. He looks like he doesn't disgusting. fit. I know. He looks like none of the other. He does. It looks like he's got no mates at the club. He just doesn't look right. Maybe that's bullshit. But all the others <laughs> always enjoy each other's company. You see that, and he, he just seems looks a bit like serious. badly he serious. Just, all the time. Serious, but you know, everyone's different, aren't they? It doesn't doesn't necessarily mean anything. I just think like it's it's not a road I want to see us going down. Make, like give them players as long as possible to see what they become and then make your decision. Don't be doing it too early. And and as I say, if you're trying to bring in these kids from like different clubs and, and show them that there's a pathway, we all made such a big thing of that like, last year. We were laughing at Chelsea. We yeah, were going, ah, look, we've brought all these oh, kids yeah, on yeah, in the yeah. cup final and yeah. we've won. And what are Chelsea doing with their kids? They're forcing them out and selling them on. They just see them as assets. I mean, and then it, like you come, we knew that all the kids who played in that cup final, we all said most of them are not going to make it here. Yeah. But if someone had said to you then, They'll be shopping half of them next summer. But maybe I, they sell Bobby just, Clark to make room for Trainee Only. Maybe, they, maybe they're, they're weighing up the two. To make room. And maybe they're saying, we want to make a statement to Trainee Only that he's What the if one. Trainee Only is one of those players who's brilliant at 16, 17, yeah. and then by 20... Yeah, he's absolutely. Brilliant. But it's not an exact science, exactly, as, as you said. Exactly, that's my point. At some point. But at some point, they've got to... They, they, it is a financial process, isn't it? They've got to pay them. They've got to bring money in. Maybe they think, we sell now, this is his peak. They've got to make a judgment at some point, and they've clearly made a judgment. Only time will tell whether it's proven correct or not. And I, I just, as long as we mitigate the mitigate the risk by putting clauses in, I'm okay with it. In terms of the Bobby Clark situation, Dave, you mentioned the fact that he played, you know, came on, played well in that cup final, and you know that might be his value ceiling. Mm-hmm. The first opportunity that you get to move him after that, like you know, you never know that might be the the peak of his value, like. I mean, he's going to go on. At the end of the day, he's going to go on and have a good career as a pro, yeah. whether it's at Liverpool or not. So, yeah. like, although it is sad that we kind of, you know, we're, we're looking to move him on, and his dreams aren't going to be accomplished at, at Liverpool. Like, he's not going to be short of a few quid. He's going to have a good career as a pro, and hopefully, he'll kick on and do really well for himself and his family. So, um, that but the fact that we might be missing out on on having a player worth more in the future or someone who might go on and, and do well for us. It's that Like the latter is something I'm not really concerned it's about. It's not about the individual in, in players. That that, that, I'm not talking about them specific individuals. It's more the basic principle of selling sure. players before you've, they've realised the potential, what they, they will or won't be. I don't like the the message that it sends. It's not. A, it's not. But a maybe Trainee only establishes himself this season, and that 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 enhances our reputation for youth development. Maybe we don't yeah, know, do we? It's, uh, it's similar to the like. I look at this as kind of in, the way they do in in the NBA, which is very sort of detached from the emotion of it all. And they look at they do look at young players and developmental projects as chips that they can use, like whether it's to. Uh, I I don't like it either, dude. Like it's one of my like main beefs with like Miami Heat fans because they're always talking about young players mm. that they can be. Oh, they, they develop this chip, they can move him on and get this free agent or do a sign and trade for this guy or free up some cap space over here. Like they are seen as commodities, and you know we're obviously owned by American sports franchise owners, so it's it's natural that this element of it is going to take over, especially when the PSR rules have been created in such a way that this is an adverse effect of it. Yeah. Like this is something, this was an unintended consequence, a loophole that clubs can exploit to, um, to, to better their prospects in terms of being sustainable in other areas. So if you present fucking John Henry and co with an option to be, um, you know, to, to, to create greater sustainability by moving on these assets, then, they, then they're going to take mm. it. And you know, an unintended consequence as it is. No, but, you're right. You know, I, I, I get all that. I guess what it comes down to for me is if Klopp and Linders were still here, this would not be happening. And that's what we've got to there try go. to get used to is like, yep. they're not here anymore. Things are going to be done differently yep. and we're not necessarily going to like it. If you could, so let me put this to you now. We've talked about three potential things that are, uh, not potential things, but three things that are mithering us during this preseason period. Contracts with the three players that we mentioned and, the, and probably the situation with the goalkeeper we should mention as well, who looks like his time is coming to an end here. The lack of new blood coming into the squad through um, sort of making a big statement through signings, identifying and, and capturing the players the managers want. And... The third, the young players being treated like chips to be cashed in. So, Paul, which of those elements would be most concerning to you? Contracts by a mile. Yeah. 
you, you, your Same. senior best world class players have to be existing proven winners won everything in the game the very foundation of everything the club's been about during one of our if not the greatest era one of our greatest eras in the history of this amazing club if you're not prioritising that then that's a that's a big, big, big worry, and as I said, I'm starting to become more concerned now. I still think that I still it justifies belief that they're not going to get at least a couple of these contracts done. But if that that, that is my number one priority now, definitely. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Sound. So, uh, should we have a look a little look ahead to um, Saturday and then answer a couple of questions that we had um, in in the lead up to the pod? So, what are you guys hoping to see um, on Saturday me hopes, morning? Hopes on the expectations. It's the, it's the fable twelve thirty kickoff the away at a we'll you know small well. ground, newly we'll promoted team. Uh, so despite be really all the negativity about um, all this other stuff, the new manager's first about, game in charge. I'm happy a lot with of like our starters what, are what we're seeing on the pitch. And, and still I think recovering we'll from their summer season. exploits it's, it's, and, and working their way comes back from to, just to full fitness. All the other you know, shit. That much it's nothing to do with Slot and, and his team. So, um, I'm positive about yeah, Slot and, and the players. And in some ways, is that a good thing about affect how this one goes, Dave? How are you? What are you hoping? he's almost he's almost sort of. Isolated from all the bullshit. It means we it? can blame the nerds for like everything that goes yeah. wrong, and and like, yeah. and we can just judge slot purely on like what we're seeing on the pitch. So a bit like we do in the group chat with Stuart, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I'm I'm really positive <laughs> about the style of play, the players we've got. You know that I think slots. I think. See, for me now, yeah. I think the game's changed that much that it's no longer about who's got the best players. I think it's that obviously plays a big part. But to me, the game now is so much about like who's the best coach and who's who's going to win the tactical battle, <laughs> and that's the most important thing. You've got to have someone. And now I know Klopp was more of a like a manager type thing. Not that, not that he didn't know his tactics, but he delegated a lot of the tactical changes to to Pep Linders because that's what he was really good at. So we had that. We had like a really talented coach out coaching the opposition, and it was very rare that we got out coached. I think Arteta's done it to us a few times recently, whereas we did have his number a couple of years ago. But Arsenal, like in in recent meetings, that, they are, yeah they have sort of looked like they've had our number at times. But it's very the man-to-man rare. marking in, in Europe yeah, last was that season. As well. That's the one yeah. where it stands out. Yeah, to there me. was that. We never had any answer to that. But it was yeah, rare. But generally right. speaking, not many teams were were out coaching us. So if you've got like, and that's that's Guardiola's strength. You know, he's whatever he is or he isn't, he's absolutely incredible tactically and the way. He, he sets his team up and stuff. Arteta looks like he's talented in, in that that regard. Whereas the teams who struggle, a lot of the time, you like they don't look very well coached. So I do think coaching is like a, a massive, massive part of the game now in comparison to where it was in the past. And I think we've got a really talented coach. So I'm hopeful that he must be coming in and looking at the the stand of the players he's working with now. No disrespect to Feyenoord, he had good players at Feyenoord, but he must be coming in and he's looking and he's like, oh my God, look at these players yeah, I'm working definitely. with now. It, it must be like Christmas morning to him. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and like over the summer, he starts off and he's working with like a lot of kids plus, you know, like Curtis and Harvey came back early uh, and then gradually senior players start coming back and it was like every week he was opening a new present and, it, you know, it, it, he must have just been looking at it going, yeah. Look at my team's just played really well here. We've just beat Arsenal, and I still haven't got Allison, Trent, Gomez, McAllister, Diaz, Nunes. I probably forgot that Gakpo. Probably forgot others. He had all of these players who weren't even there, and he was watching his team playing well and winning these games. So I'm really positive about that. I think he'll set the team up. You know, he knows what he's doing tactically. He's got a lot of good players to work with. I think he'll have us set up like, and we'll be far too mm. strong for Ipswich, regardless of of what eleven he puts out. And I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to Saturday. I think it'll go well. Yeah, to- totally agree. I mean, I think um, 
so I, I like Dave I expect we're going to have a good season I think he's going to I think we're going to play some decent football I think he's going to get his ideas across and the players are going to look really well drilled in fact I think at times they'll look more drilled you'll be able to see the patterns of play more clearly than we sometimes saw them under Jürgen particularly in the last season or two um, that's not the same thing as having better results but certainly I think we'll see that um, I, I want to see the players enjoying themselves I want to see the, the, the joy in the football I want to see good goals and I think we're likely to see all those things based on what we've seen so far um, so I think I, I, I'm not expecting any upsets on Saturday I think it's going to be a good win and we're going to play some good stuff um, I think the questions are, are, in my mind are, are, are for beyond Saturday really in terms of can he sustain it how does he deal with the stuff that Dave was alluding to in terms of the challenge presented by these these world class managers that the Premier League's full of you know you can go down that list there's some extreme I mean they are by definition managing the Premier League most of them are, you know amongst the very best in the world at what they do um, so so that'll be interesting to see how he deals with that also interesting to see how he deals with moving forward world class talent you know he is a coach but he has to lead these players as well and, and we hear good things about how he leads players there's all lots of positive things been said about him in the past but he's never had a Mo Salah he's never had an Alison Becker he's never had a Trent Alexander-Arnold or a Virgil van Dijk mm -hmm. you know how does he handle these characters and personalities how does he make sure that they feel wanted, part of part of what he wants what he wants to achieve? And also, against the context of all four of those players, question marks over their futures. You know, that's a big question for him. He's he's under the spotlight like he's never been in his career. He's gonna be at the minutiae of everything he does is gonna be scrutinised to the nth degree. He's gonna be asked a million and one mundane questions to him multiple times. Um, in one press conference and then multiple press conferences a week. Um, so I, I question marks about how does he rotate? He's got a, a, an embarrassment of riches at the likes of which he's never seen before. Is he going to be able to use that and keep winning? Is he going to be able to, because that, at Liverpool he will need to do that because no one is going to expect him, is going to say it's all right if he doesn't challenge on all four fronts. We'll expect him to be making a good fist of all four competitions. The strength of our squad no one's going to say free pass in the League Cup or the FA Cup. Yeah, we won't be expecting to see the best players in there. But we want to see evidence that he can do what Klopp did, which is to get the young lads playing and winning in those competitions, rest the big boys and then get them playing and winning in the two big competitions. So, yeah, I feel very positive really about him as far as you can be when you're following Jurgen Klopp. No real alarm bells about him at the moment. Um, and I'm expecting good things. The question for me is just is how good is it going to be and how does he negotiate the unique challenges presented by a, a job of this scale and complexity? Well put, mate. Um, Dave, I think making a prediction for this season it is easier than it could be given all of those, uh, given all those variables. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, the top two doing, will likely get stay all the as the top two. The they are for the season, but I feel given, like you know, it's going to be a you have to do of, that uh, when the window finding shuts now, period for us. I don't expect well, everything to be 100% smooth. Results will probably reflect that. There'll be some good, some bad, as we normally see when new managers come in. So we're not doing like proper predictions until the window shuts. But I think below us, it's kind of, you know, there isn't that much to worry about not finishing inside the top four, for instance. Um, um, like, how do you feel? What are your expectations? I think if we finish above Where Arsenal, we we'll might win the end league. up finishing. This and the season. reason I'm saying that is because I don't see any way, regardless of how severe, like whether Man City's punishment is as severe as it should be, I don't see any way they avoid some sort of mm. significant points deduction. Um, which, if it if it's by the end of the season, I'm assuming. It'll be, which it's supposed to be. They've said any appeal will be heard before the end of this season. So I'm assuming that means the punishment will be for this season as well as whatever else they get. I mean, I can only speculate on that, but I don't see any way. If you look at what happened to Everton and Forest for like one charge, City are looking at some sort of points deduction, which you'd like to think 
that will put them below us if that comes to pass. So then you're looking at like, okay, well, we've got to finish above Arsenal, and if we do, if we can finish above Arsenal, there's a good chance that we'd be winning the league. Um, that's all got to play out, and you know we've got to see. But as of now, I think Arsenal stronger than us. Um, they finished above us last season because we fell away at the end. But let's not forget, after 30 games, we were top. So we fell away for the, like that last eight game stretch. That's what cost us. But these teams who are supposedly, we look at and go, yeah, they're much stronger than us. Well, they weren't that much stronger last year up until the wheels just fell off us. So we should learn from that. And we should be stronger as a result of it. So... I'm expecting a good season, but we don't know because if something happens, if we have a sticky spell, that's where it's going to be interesting to see. Like, how to, not just the fans, like the fans might get twitchy about slot, but we don't know how the players are going to react in those situations as yeah. well. Because there, there may well be an, uh, an element of like the stepdad and like things aren't going well and he's telling a player off for something and they're like, you're not my dad. Are you used to tell me that because they're so used to Jürgen? So that that's something that could come into play if we had a bad run. Hopefully not. And hopefully like he's strong enough to deal with anything like that. That's that leadership test yeah, we were talking yeah, about well, earlier, Dave, isn't it? All, the How signs are good that? based on what people have said about him, but we don't know until like that, that situation arises, do we? So that's a question mark, which we, we'll see. But I do think he's a really good coach. He's got really good players. And I don't see us finishing any worse than third because, like, I watched the overlap today and the way they were, like, dismissing us mm. and, and talking up United. I'm like, do you just never Crazy. fucking learn? Embarrassing. Like, Neville, especially, but it's not just him. I'm like, do you not. What, what makes you think that United is suddenly going to become good? Because they beat City in the cup final. Is that is that based on that? Because prior to that game. Ten Hag was on his way and everyone was talking about how shit he was and, and what a mess United were. I'm not worried about United in the slightest. There's no way they finish above us. If they finish above us, we've had a terrible season. Chelsea, loads of talent, complete basket case club. I don't see it. I mean, what they're doing to Conor Gallagher is disgusting, by the way. He's the fucking captain and like they're not even letting him train with the first team because they're trying to force him out. So... And that deal hasn't gone through now, did you see? Like, there's a there's a problem at the no, other end, so he's had to fly back to see, London. See, they've made them train at the academy with um, Chalabet as well, because they were trying to sell them, so they, they wouldn't even let them train with the first team. Um, you know, what kind of message is that? Just no class whatsoever. So, I don't, I'm not worried about Chelsea. I think their manager may find himself in trouble. If Pochettino had still been there, I think Chelsea may have been a factor, because it looked like... He'd started to, to turn the corner with them, and they looked like they were maybe about to, to to kick on. And then he's gone. They brought in like a fella from West Brom, may or may not be good, but probably won't get the chance to prove it either way. So not worried about them. Villa, really good season last year. Lots of good players. How are they going to cope with Champions League football and and Premier League football? Like made some changes to the squad as well. Yeah, haven't they? I I think well, I, I think that it'll still be good, but maybe there's a bit of a Newcastle syndrome about them. Uh, I think that slightly better than Newcastle were when they got in the top four. To be fair, but still, you know, I, I'd, I'd be surprised. Certainly got a better manager. Yeah, I'd be su- got a much yeah, better manager. Yeah, but I'd still be surprised if they finished above us. Tottenham, no, not not particularly concerned about them either. Not even with your boy Domas there. Oh yeah, it's, no, it's a good sign for them, but. No, I'm not. I'm not worried about Spurs. I think Spurs will be Spurs. They'll do what they always do. They'll be in and around it, but not really ultimately much of a threat to anyone. Um, so no, I'd, I'd, I don't see us finishing any lower than third. And depending on what happens with City, which I think they will get some sort of points deduction. Um, yeah, just try to finish above Arsenal. Oh, that's a good question. Whoever, there's a couple in my mind. I think whoever ends up um, playing this number six role for slot is going to be important. I suspect it's going to be McAllister. Paul, who do you think is um, going to be our um, be able to most important player this season? Well. I've just got a feeling that this could be Jota's season. Just with, you know, the 
the fitness thing and I, I don't know I don't know maybe maybe not maybe it's too much to hope for because his fitness record has not been great but Slot builds his teams around to, to to create multiple chances for the number nine and I know that and this is not a this is not a knock on Dave's boy but I know that like Dave understandably feels that you know Darwin will get lots of chances in that number nine position to, to really show his, his true class because of the way we play but I actually wonder if, if, if Jota stays fit if Jota could put up some crazy numbers um, because he's clearly the most talented and clinical striker that we've got and if you have a system a player in that position in a system designed to give him chances and you've got a player of that quality who's there every week maybe he could be the one because firepower wise I still stand by what we all felt last season, that our firepower surpasses that of anyone else in the league. And I think if you add a bit of control into the mix, which will tighten us up from those silly goals that we conceded that cost us last season, we kept conceding first and going behind. If with a team with more control that starts banging the goals in, um, maybe Jota could be the one. So, yeah, so that... I, I think we're going to have a good season, Chris, I think. And I, do you know, I'd not... Despite the fact I've kind of like done nothing other than think about City getting relegated, I'd not actually put it together in terms of the point Dave made. I'd not put it together in my mind in terms of the, the, the point that Dave just made then about City at the very least having a points deduction. I think he's absolutely spot on there. So I was thinking around Liverpool being the second or third best team in the league. So probably my head was saying third. My heart was saying with a fair wind and slot getting things underway, maybe second. But, you know, maybe the season could be better mm -hmm. than that. Um, but I certainly, I, I, only see, I only see two teams and squads mm -hmm. that are in the argument for being better than Liverpool. And then after that, we need to see how he, how he goes. Um, yeah, I, see, I feel we're going to have a good season. Nunes, Nunes. <laughs> you know, all joking apart. I agree with what Paul said about Jota there for the start. At the same time, we're playing loads of games. There's there's going to be like plenty of games for all of them. I think Jota will also play on the left at times. He may even play on the right because if Mo's not playing, Mo's not going to play every single game. It would be stupid to play him every single game because it's not like the Europa League where you can just bring Dave, him on for 20 you, minutes or whatever. Our, Champions our, League games, he's going to play season, some of those yeah. games, which may mean he has to sit out at the weekend because you can't play him twice a week I know he's done it before but there comes a point where you've got to say okay he's in his 30s now we've got to manage it a little bit so Jota's the most versatile of the forwards Diaz as well to some extent Diaz could play on the right if necessary but so I think there'll be loads of games for Nunes to play in and the, the only reason I'm saying about him being important is because he needs to do what he should be doing he's you know I've fought his corner and I've said a lot of it's been down to bad luck and stuff and I still maintain that but he's got to do better as well you know I don't think it's as bad as people have been making out bad luck's played a part but bad finishing has also played a part he's got to sharpen up and he also needs a bit more luck and if that happens he'll score the goals that we need him to score and that will make a big difference to us if everyone else is still doing what they're doing so getting those extra goals from him will be like massive for us but I also agree with Paul about like the, the the numbers whoever's playing number six but there's going to be sort of two players playing in there because of the way it is now it's like it's not like the responsibility of one player you know there'll be two deeper and then one who's a little bit more free and that's not like the deep players just sit deep all the time you know they're still going to have license to get forward but yeah the, if we sort out the midfield and get the right balance so finding players who are going to gel and work together now that could be McAllister and Gravenberg it could be McAllister and Jones you know it, it, who knows McAllister and Endo actually worked really well together last season but that was in a, a, a different style of different style of play different setup but you get that balance right in midfield assuming we don't sign anybody I still think I'm not necessarily buying into this it was Zubamendi or nobody I, I feel like that just seems too stupid to, to actually I can't get my head around like if that's the case, but it would make sense for them to not immediately rush in to go for somebody else and play the hand. But you'd like to think they've got irons in the fire there, so maybe they get another midfield player in. That makes McAllister's life easier, and uh, I think 
I think overall, I, I know I've said Nunes, but I think McAllister's our most important player, and he may well be, by the end of the season, we may well undisputedly say he's our best player. I don't think I can say that at the moment. He's in the conversation, but I still think Virgil and Trent and to some it, Mo, if he's in. Yeah, well, that, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Unless Real Madrid come calling, <laughs> but yeah, I, is he our best player right now? I don't know. He's in the conversation. I think by the end of the season, if he if he progresses the way he has been, he may well be like our, clearly our best player. But I don't know. Other players could step up. You know, Trent could have like a massive season. It's just I don't know. Um, that's a that's an interesting one, Trent as well. I mean, we've done that to death, so I don't really want to talk about it now. But what? Do we think there's by the end of the season he's going to be the only one of these players left? No, no, I think he's just going to be. No, I agree. So, I, I, by I, default. I don't see him Chris, what yeah. about you? No. So, I'd be glad to see that put to bed, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah agreed. So, answer your own question then, Chris, about most important player. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shout. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. Nah, I don't think so. I mean, if he was going to, he would have started a midfield on. Um, he would have started a midfield on Sunday, wouldn't he? So, you know. Um, McAllister, I think. I fucking love him. I think he's ace. I think he's gonna. He's gonna be. He's gonna be like one of the best players in the league this season. If he wasn't already, but you know, he's. There's possible Cody. player of the year talk Definitely. with him. I think after he's the, fucking uh, after the summer, magician. Um, um, but in terms of a little a, bit, a not so much farther down the trough, but the players that you're looking I think for more from coming into this season, the ones who could really kick to, on yeah, and, and make the themselves mainstays in the team and, and really important players for us, of that crop of players, you know, the likes of Gakpo, Diaz, Gravenberch, Sobis Light to a certain extent. Of, the, um, of that sort of ilk player that we're really him. gonna need to kick on, who do you think is the one who's most likely to um, to do that for us? Paul? But there are, yeah, there's a, there's a number of them that have got question okay. marks over them who who need to really, um, and as I said earlier, it'd be interesting to see what happens there. But yeah, I think Cody's the one most likely to, and it's still it's a bit strange the ongoing sort of low level talk about Diaz going. You know, and I just wonder whether um, you know Cody might establish himself on the left and and you know make that place his own, and and maybe the club have partly got that in mind that they think you know move Diaz on, and we've actually got somebody potentially better for the way we want to play now. So if they move there, Diaz um, on, they'll sign Gordon, surely. Maybe, maybe, yeah. And Dave, how about you? I know you'd be tempted to say Darwin, but um, of of the other lads who are in that sort of on the cusp. Potentially. Well, I hope it is Darwin, but um, yeah. if I disregard him and just go with the others, um, I really want to see more from Sobers like. Oh yeah. yeah. And do you I think we will? He, though, I thought he that, I'm not sure. I thought he looked good against Seville in that in that like free run and roll where he was he was able to like we saw it with the goal he set up for Diaz. I mean that's a great run and great awareness to just roll it across. Really like that. Um, yeah, I, I want to see more from him, but. As of now, I think he, if he's in the team, I feel like he's he's really fortunate to be keeping Harvey Elliott out if he starts. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he needs to step it up because I feel like his ceiling's probably the highest. Of of if I'm disregarding Darwin and talking about all the others, who's got the highest ceiling? It it's it should be Sobers like I think he he could be phenomenal, but he's got to do more. The way he started he had last season Euros. suggested he was something special, and then it, he never kicked on at all. He he, he went backwards, yeah. didn't he? Just, a, I mean, this. And judging by the summer, it's it, you know, I, I'm not as positive about him as I could be. I thought he came across as a bit of a bell end, as hungry captain. He's constantly throwing himself to the ground, complaining at referees, walking about the place, remonstrating all the time. Didn't play very well. Didn't lead by example. I'm really concerned about him, to be honest. I think we kind of. Those first ten games that we had when we were comparing him to to Gerard yeah. are going to make us all look a little bit we'll silly. Never learn, so obviously the talents <laughs> there. No, I'm not sure the mentality's there with him, um, but I, hopefully I'm proven wrong. He's the he's the one of the crop that I'm actually least convinced about yeah. uh, rising to the occasion this season and, and you know justifying why we all thought so highly of him. But yeah, like you say, the talents there, the ceilings there, 
it's now time for him to go out and prove it. He's had that year to adjust. He's had the ups and downs, the injuries. You know, he's going to get plenty of chances to play in a system that arguably suits him much better than it did under Jurgen. So go out there and, and show us something, mm. and you know, just to justify why you're so highly rated in the game. But yeah, um, so. We've we've covered a, f- a few things there, a few of our little predictions. We'll get into that into more detail. Obviously, after the first game, we might have a little bit of a better idea, but we'll we'll do some some broader stuff on that front uh, moving forward. Um, there are a couple of questions from the listeners that we had, Dave, that seem to that, that, that definitely sort of remonstrated with me a little bit. Um, certainly, the the idea of Caradonna said on Twitter he asked whether we would trade um, Luis Diaz for Anthony Gordon straight up. Um, I think I think Diaz is a better player than Gordon right now, but he's also like three, four years older than him. So you can make a case that like it, you're getting an upgrade by bringing in a younger player. So I see the argument for it. Um, if it happened, I wouldn't like I wouldn't be up in arms over it by any means. But I do feel like a lot of our fans underrate Diaz. I feel like if you look around. You know, what we're expecting from him but if you actually look around like the players out of the top teams who play in this position like look at Martinelli at Arsenal Trossard at Arsenal they're not really putting up better numbers than Diaz is so I feel like we maybe expect a, a bit not too much from him because it, it's it's similar to Nunes in that like you think he should score more goals he's getting chances he's got to be a bit more clinical but I do think he's undervalued by a lot of our fans now um, I don't think you're as big as fan, are you, Chris? So you're probably, no. yeah, you're probably one of those who's like, yeah, move him on, get Gordon in. And I've got, as I say, I've got no objection to that, but I wouldn't be in any mad rush to do it. And Anthony Gordon, I'll, I'll be honest, he's proved me wrong because I thought he was shit when he was at Everton and clubs were coming in. I'm like, what, 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 why are they paying that kind of money for him? All he does is run fast and throw himself to the floor. That's it. There's no end product. doesn't do anything. And even when he first went to Newcastle, I'm watching him and still thinking it's the same. And then as last season went on, I'm like, okay, he is a horrible diving bastard and I can't stand him. I don't like his face, but he's a fucking good player. So, and then the longer the season goes on, he starts making all these like little, little noises and like, Comments about Anfield best stadium, well. best away stadium, or Anfield. The hairs on the back of your neck go up when you're here. You'll never walk alone. And it was just kind of, just like laying down a bit of chum for us, wasn't it? Like just letting us know the best player he's played. Yeah, played just stuff like that. It's just like you're like, oh, okay. So and then it, it emerges. He was actually a red his whole life. I thought he was a blue. Turns out he's not. He's always been like a massive red. But we let him go when he was. I think 12 or something like that, and he ends up at Everton. So he wants to come here. That's pretty obvious. Uh, we clearly like him, but the way this club operates, it seems highly unlikely that they would bring him in while they've still got Diaz. We don't really do that. I know we, we brought Diaz in when we still had Sadio, but we knew Sadio was going in six months. So I can't see them just going out and signing Gordon. But if Diaz, if an offer was to come in that they liked for Diaz and Diaz fancied the move, which there's a lot of noises, mainly from his dad, about Barcelona, uh, I don't think they can afford him. So I don't see that happening. So I think Diaz stays with us and Gordon waits till next year. Um, he needs to not sign a new contract at Newcastle. Like if we're if we're interested in him, we need to make that clear. Look, we'll come back for you in twelve months when presumably. Mo might be off and there'll be like a wages to spare and like a, a place in the squad for them or Diaz might even go next year or whatever where there'll be actually there'll be room in the squad to bring him in under the um, you know like the restrictions that like we operate in from like club policy and that so mm-hmm. I don't see it happening now unless unless Diaz leaves and I don't think Diaz is going to leave so Anthony Gordon would probably have to wait and tell him not to sign a new contract at Newcastle unless he's got an escape clause. Which might actually happen. He gets his pay rise at Newcastle, he has an escape clause, and then maybe we go in for him next summer. But I don't see it happening now. Just quickly, Paul, would you make that trade straight up? I know it's massively hypothetical, but if you could if you could just swap Diaz for Anthony Gordon, would you? 
don't don't feel that strongly about it either way, Chris. I mean, I, it's, yeah. I, I agree with pretty much everything Dave said about Gordon. Find him hard to root for. I must admit, the diving stuck in the craw a little bit. But he, yeah, I've had to, as Dave said, got to admit he's a talented player. Also, yeah, I do like the fact that he's a red and that he clearly does want to come. That's a good sign. Homegrown, but then the homegrown thing also. I'm thinking, well, why are you trying to move Joe Gomez in the other direction when we've got a homegrown issue? Yeah. That was weird. Mm-hmm. Proper weird. Um, so, yeah, wouldn't object, but don't feel very strongly about either player. Don't feel strongly about Diaz. Don't feel strongly about Gordon. Think they're both good players. Not a, not much between them, really. So, it's not something I'd actively go after, but if it happens, it happens. And uh, one more question. I'll start with you on this one, Paul. Um I think I know what your answer is going to be, but the same source, uh, our friend Kane Caradonna on uh, Twitter asked um, whether it should be uh, Connor Bradley or Trent Alexander-Arnold starting at right back this year. Oh, absolutely, Trent. He's, he's world-class, sensational player. Love Connor Bradley, great lad, but he's not Trent. No, it's Trent, easy. And, and Connor will have, Connor, Connor have, Connor have plenty of time. Connor, Connor will get games. Um, Connor got quite a lot of games. Dave, is that an easy decision for you? Yeah, I can't disagree. I love Connor Bradley and I think he's going to be a, a great player. He's already a superb player. But yeah, it's Trent for me. And we've got enough games that, you know, Connor will still, will still get plenty of opportunities. And you don't know what will happen mm-hmm. with injuries and stuff as well. Things can change. But yeah. as of right now, yeah, it's got to be Trent. And I think it, it does amaze me the way some, some fans talk about Trent. Like you see a lot of them just talking like he's some liability that we're carrying, and and it's like, am I watching the same player? Because yeah. I, I know that there's faults there, and there's there's some flaws, but fuck me, he's he's a phenomenal player. Good stuff, guys. Well, is there anything else you guys want to add before we we, we call time on this one? Long season ahead, a lot of pods coming up. Just very briefly, I know we can't go into depth on it because it hasn't actually happened, but this um, the goalkeeper. yeah, yeah Marmadash Villy. I mean, on the face of it. Two thoughts, really. One, a little bit worried that it looks like Allison's definitely going next summer, um, which there's no upside to that. Like, he's the best keeper we've ever had, and that's a concern. Although, you know, maybe, he's, you know, sometimes that just happens. Players just want a fresh challenge. But two, it seems pretty sensible. You know, 30 million seems a good price from what, what I know about him. Uh, loaning him out for a year, maybe to Bournemouth, so he gets Premier League experience. Not sure whether that's possible. Dave and I were chatting before about whether that's possible or not. But certainly, you know, obviously this isn't a deal that's happened yet. But uh, if if you put to one side the fact that it suggests Allison's going to leave, um, just the the deal that they're doing for him makes a lot of sense. It looks like very very sensible, good piece of business for a, a player who's potentially got an incredibly high ceiling as a keeper. Um, first and foremost, it's like. It tells you Alison has given us notice. Whether that's one year or two, nobody seems to know. Some of the stories are that he'll be loaned out for two years, which I think that's what Chelsea did with Courtois, wasn't it? They had Czech, they signed Courtois, and he, he was at Atletico Madrid for two years. And then they had to make the decision, and they, they brought him over. So maybe it'd be one year, maybe it'd be two years, who knows. But I think it's a, it's, it's a smart move. If that's who they've identified as like the next big thing up and coming goalkeeper and you know there is a lot of talk about him like a lot of big clubs are looking at him he's supposed to be um special and it makes sense if you can get that deal done i just think it's quite funny that like fans are clamoring for signings now we need this we need that and then we go out and sign someone who may not come here for like one or two years but if you look at that just in isolation, if you look at this potential deal in isolation and ignore everything else that's going on and or not going on, I think yeah, it's a smart move, makes sense, and no problem with it at all. Just sad as long if as it means Allison's going because Allison yeah. has got so many years left in him as like the best around. But if he's decided he wants to go, I mean, John Achterberg said he almost went. He said like we were close to losing him now, like this summer, and if Taffarel had gone. Allison would have gone as well. That was the only thing that kept him around because he, he. I don't. I don't think Allison liked the fact that the goalkeeper department just got decimated. You know, Akterberg went, Jack Robinson went. Obviously, Adrian's leaving. Keller is probably going to leave because they're like a, a close unit. You know, they work together rather than with team, the rest of the, the squad. Team. Yeah, it is. And Allison supposedly 
according to Achterberg, Alison said to him, like, I don't want any of you to go. I want to keep, the, keep us all together. And as it's turned out, it's basically going to be Alison, Tafferell, and a couple of the kids, maybe. Uh, and everyone else will have gone. So maybe Alison's just decided, yeah, it's time for me. Because the Saudis have been sniffing around him. They're going to be offering him crazy money. Um, so maybe he's just said, yeah, in 12 months' time, I'm, I'm going to be off. Yeah. Which if he's if he's given us notice and said like I'll give you another year to find me a replacement or whatever, and then we've gone out and found the replacement, well that, that that's that's good. It's a good process, boys, isn't it? Yeah, as as long as he doesn't turn out like the last player who's signing was deferred for a year. Yeah, Nabby, oh, Nabby lad, okay, no, don't want Monty's don't want boy, Nabby Mark too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, Chris. Just thought that was worth mentioning. I know it's not a done deal, but it's a pretty big piece of news. It looks like there it has it got seems legs, close. So. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. a quick point. We have had like a lot of questions, but we've been running like nearly two hours, so we haven't got time to do them. But we'll probably throw a few in after uh, after Saturday's game because they'll still be valid after that. So if your question wasn't read, read out on this one, yeah, it might it might be the next one or even the one after that. A lot of it's transfer window related anyway, so yeah, yeah, we'll get to them. Predictions then? I'm going three nil. Saturday. Yeah, three nil. Three one. I'm thinking. I don't know enough about Ipswich other than they've come up. They play really nice football, which probably helps us. They're not I'm dogs. Gonna, I'm gonna go four nil. Four nil. Chris, you've you've gone three one. Are you going for us conceding like after five minutes and then having to come back? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's twelve thirty. I wouldn't away be from home on a Saturday morning. <laughs> you know, like you know, the more things change, the more yeah. they stay the same. So. Uh, yeah, I'm fully prepared for that. I could for that little, see that. Uh, I could absolutely that little early see that. kick in the knackers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we'll be all right though. Yeah. I think we'll be all right. You know, um, should have enough there to get by them and then some. Um, all right. I'm a little bit bummed now ending the podcast on the thought that Allison's Allison's going to be going. It's sad to see this great team just sort of. Yeah. I mean, it's inevitable, right? It's it mm-hmm. happens happens to every great team. One of them drop off one at the time, father time undefeated and all that, but. You know, good job with signing all these <laughs> these good players to be excited about in the future, there, right? Um, anyway, um, well, Dave still two and the weeks. boys. There's still two weeks. You never know. Yeah. Is right. the two weeks what date are we on? Yeah, there's 14, still a little bit more than two yeah. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Still plenty of time. Yeah. We'll be scratching around on deadline day as usual. You've had all <laughs> summer to do it, and then every year it's always the same, isn't it? Clubs just like yeah. panicking, trying to get deals over the line. So you've literally had all summer. <laughs> right right okay uh, let's leave it there then boys for today and uh, Dave I'm sure you'll be back on um, Saturday afternoon Saturday evening yeah. right after the game um, with some instant analysis on Arna Slot's first game in charge of Liverpool manager let's not lose sight of the fact that this is uh, the, the main thing that we're going to be concentrating on here um, big new exciting era at the club hopefully it gets off to a good start and until then we'll catch you soon